Welcome back to our Fox News Town Hall with Mayor Pete Buttigieg at Stevens High School in Claremont, New Hampshire. We want to turn now to foreign policy, which we haven't had much of a chance to talk about. Brian Cohen is a teacher at the Putney School, also from that strange place called Vermont. Brian? <laughs> Hi, Mayor Pete. Oh. Um, you've seen war firsthand. I'm wondering, under what circumstances would you consider the use of military force? You know, when you have been ordered abroad uh, on the command of a U.S. president, you think a lot about what's at stake in that office. And there's nothing more grave than the fact that uh, that office holds the power to deploy troops into war zones. I'm really concerned about the fact that right now we're seeing that power talked about in a very casual way. First, there was saber rattling, a suggestion that we would send troops to deal with Venezuela, which, as horrible as the situation is there, is not one where I see U.S. lives at risk. Uh, and now you see the same thing, or something different, but uh, that same kind of saber rattling with Iran. Uh, by the way, reportedly engineered by John Bolton, who was one of the people who built the war in Iraq. How somebody who was behind that, one of the worst foreign policy mistakes in American history, is allowed anywhere near the situation room of a president who claims, probably falsely, but claims that he was against the Iraq war all along, is unbelievable to me. The next... <laughs> the next president will have two major jobs overseas. One of them is just establishing U.S. credibility again. But the other one is setting a bar, and I believe it must be a higher bar than we've had so far, on what it takes for troops to be deployed overseas, especially unilaterally. Uh, and I think that that bar has to be based on when core U.S. life or death interests are at stake. And if they're not, uh, or if they're not immediately threatened in a way that leaves us no other choice, then it doesn't mean we retreat into our shell. We can use economic, diplomatic, cyber, and other security tools in order to deal with it. But you do not send young men and women into war when there's an alternative. Mayor, let's, let's talk about this a little. You gave us a kind of overview there, but, but yeah. from your six, seven months on the ground in Afghanistan, what is the biggest lesson? In a, maybe it's a little one, but, but you know, a, a specific one, but the biggest lesson that you would take into the Oval Office should you become commander in chief? Well, uh, one of the biggest, actually, is, aside from the foreign policy and security matters, is just the experience of coming to know and trust Americans who are completely different from you. Uh, part of my job was, was driving or guarding vehicles when we took uh, vehicle movements outside the wire, uh, either around Kabul or occasionally between Kabul and Bagram. And when somebody got in my vehicle, they did not care whether I was a Democrat or Republican. They did not care what country my dad immigrated from or whether I was going home to, to a boyfriend or girlfriend. They wanted to know if uh, I had studied the route and knew how to look out for IEDs and if I had chambered around in my M4 and if I knew what to do if something happened to us. And that kind of trust that we built, people of different ages and races and definitely different political views. Uh, some of the folks I served with might be watching right now. Um, that, that kind of bond is something that uh, I wish more Americans had. But I don't think you should have to go to war in order to have it. It's one of the reasons why I think national service, at a time like this where we're so fractured and divided, would do a lot of good. Yes, military, but perhaps also more opportunities in the Peace Corps or AmeriCorps. Different service here opportunities that young people can have here in the U.S. to thicken the fabric. The other thing that I learned while I was abroad is even during these challenging times, at least this, my deployment, of course, was before this presidency, but um, how much respect people have for our country. I really could feel that when I walked into a room, especially on a, on a ISAF headquarters base where you had people from every uh, country in our coalition, that, that that flag that was on my shoulder represented a country that was known for keeping its word. E even our enemies viewed us that way. And however imperfectly we've upheld our values, I could feel how important that was uh, to our safety, as important as my body armor. And when I read reports that the president is considering pardoning or even preemptively pardoning war criminals, even after they have been tried by a jury of their peers, meaning that other U.S. service members in a legal proceeding determined that they had committed crimes, that is undermining the foundation of American moral authority. And I think in the long run, that is putting troops at risk. All right, let's get back to some questions. Seithu, and I hope I get this right, Seithu Odeyapin 
Did I do okay on that safe? Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay. <laughs> it, well, listen, you know, it took me a long time for Buttigieg, so. I can relate. <laughs> Fellow member of the unpronounceable He is a student club. who will be voting in his first election in 2020. Right. Saithu, your right. question. Hi, Mayor Pete. Um, as a student entering college next year, my question is how are you going to address the student debt crisis that affects so many of us? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for raising that. Are, are you attending here in New Hampshire? Do you know yet? Or? No, I'm attending Harvard next year. Oh, okay. All right. Good stuff. Uh, so, look, college affordability is reaching crisis levels now. And uh, this is a personal issue for us because uh, our hassle, household has six-figure debt right now. Um, and we can't go on like this. Not if we want to be a country where education has actually traditionally been a, an engine of mobility. It's how people of every background were able to get ahead. So there's some things we need to do on the back end, like I think if I can refinance the uh, mortgage rate on a house, you ought to be able to do that with your student debt. Uh, and I think we ought to have more... Uh, yeah. We also have more ways to work that debt off, like the public service loan forgiveness program, which I think is a, uh, a really great idea, but it's almost impossible to access those benefits. But we also should be doing something on the front end so that uh, when you're uh, getting to be my age uh, someday, um, you're not faced with, with those same issues. And that's where we've got to make sure that Pell Grants are massively expanded so that they are actually, and this time, let's actually peg it to inflation so we don't have to go back to Congress every time. We've got to work with states, and I'm afraid New Hampshire uh, is among the, uh, the one where the state does the least to keep college costs under control, but it's happening all over the country. So we've got to work with the states and press them uh, using a kind of carrot and stick approach from the federal government uh, in order to make sure that uh, they are carrying enough of the load that it doesn't all come down on the students. And then we've got to look at those other opportunities uh, that make it possible for students through things like service uh, to be able to get whatever debt they do emerge with, which I think should be zero if you're a low or middle income student. I'm not prepared to promise that for the child of a billionaire going to any school, but I do think for everybody, uh, if you have any college debt at all, there should be opportunities to have that reduced or waived based on things like public service. Mayor, I uh, want to get one more question in in this segment, and I'm going to need a short answer from you. Right. You sorry, talk about a lot of structural changes. Mm -hmm. One of the things you talk about is perhaps perhaps changing the Supreme Court and making it 15 instead of 9. You talk about doing away with the Electoral College. I really want to ask you this question because here in New Hampshire, in the general election, less than one half of one percent of the total popular vote is cast. On the other hand, New Hampshire has four electoral votes and in a close contest, those become pretty precious and you see the major candidates come up here. Wouldn't your plan to do away with the Electoral College hurt a state like New Hampshire? Well, first of all, New Hampshire's status as an early primary state is one of the things that sees to it that there is a lot of attention paid here. And it's uh, actually something that I think forces us candidates to get out of national media mode and actually engage people in a human way, which is helpful. But when it comes to the general election, at risk of sounding simplistic, I think the right thing to do is just to have everybody's vote count the same. Look, states don't vote, people do. And the... The interest of somebody living in one part of this state versus another part of this state isn't the exact same just because they happen to be part of the same state. Uh, I think if, if we're going to call ourselves a democracy, it would be fitting for us to pick our president by just counting up all the votes and giving it to the person who got the most. I don't think it's that hard a concept, and I don't know why we're resisting that kind of change. Mayor Pete, thank you. Coming up. We're going to get a little personal with the mayor in a lightning round that you don't want to miss. When we return, i got to tease this so they'll stay around. We, when we return to Stevens High School, home of the Cardinals, here in New Hampshire.